<laughs> Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Poetry at the Point Online, a monthly reading series organized by the St. Louis Poetry Center. My name is Kenneth Pruitt. I use he, him pronouns. I am the curator and host of this reading series. I'm really excited to be with you this evening and to bring you the poetry of A. Wolum, Kenneth Woods, aka Kenny Fresh, and Stephen Schroeder. Welcome to all of you. I'm really, really excited to hear your poems. Uh, before we get started, a couple of quick announcements. St. Louis Poetry Center turns 75 years old this year. So in addition to our new look, which hopefully you have surely seen, maybe on the top right-hand corner of your screen right now, we also have some commemorative activities in the works that are going to launch in August. Um, so look for updates this summer when we will also announce our plans for uh, our hopeful return to in-person, live-in-the-flesh events uh, in the fall. Secondly, we always want to thank our many members and supporters here at St. Louis Poetry Center. You can find out how to be a member at stlouispoetrycenter.org. Big shout out, as always, to the Missouri Arts Council, whose generous, generous support uh, helps make this series possible every single year. Um, in, uh, in terms of technology, if you're watching this in real time on Facebook Live on the 25th of May, please comment and share the link, um, but also post your questions for the poets themselves, because uh, if and when we have some time at the end before the, the hour is up, we're going to engage in some uh, questions and answers with these folks. So if you have some questions or some thoughts you want to um, pose into that conversation space, we really, really invite you to do, do so. If you're viewing this after May 25th, please do, do still comment um, and share the posted video because that's how we continue to build support for this reading series. Um, and we're also going to post some links on Facebook for you to support these poets by accessing more of their work. So again, please do engage with us in that way. All right. So now on to the reason that you are here, some poetry. And we're gonna start with A. Wolum. A was born and raised in Myanmar, in Burma. Uh, she currently resides in St. Louis, Missouri as a scientist by training and a poet by passion. A tells stories with data and poems. I love that combination. Her poems have appeared in Tinderbox Poetry Journal, Cha, an Asian literary journal, and Soliloquies Anthology. She's currently telling the stories of Myanmar's struggle for democracy after the Myanmar military staged a coup on February 1st of 2021. So without further ado, I give you the floor, A. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, Kenneth. I want to thank St. Louis Poetry Center and Kenneth for inviting me to share my work with you all today uh, in the company of awesome poets tonight. So I'm very excited to be here. So as Kenneth mentioned, um, I um, am born and raised in Burma or Myanmar, and I've been in the United States for about 30 years now, and I call St. Louis as my home. But um, I started writing poems um, years ago, about 20 or more years ago, uh, mainly to um, as a way to connect back to my roots. So by writing poems, I am bringing up memories of my own or lived experiences of my family, of my uh, friends and people that I have, uh, people and places that I have left behind. So poetry is for me a way to connect back to the past as well as to the presence of what I am, where I am at. Without further ado, I will start reading my poems. Tonight I selected a few poems from my Burmese collection. So you'll get to hear about uh, my experiences or my in the inspiration that I drawn from um, my experience with Burma. The first poem um, is called Burmese Way to Socialism. And this poem is me looking back at a time in the 80s where Burma um, was under the uh, dictatorship and Burma still is under the dictatorship. It's been there for about 60 some years now at the point with just a brief glimpse of democracy for five years, the last five years, but that will change as Kenneth mentioned on February 1st when military stage cool. So the first poem is looking back at 1989, where Burma was under what is termed the Burmese way to socialism. So the, the poem goes like this, Burmese way to socialism, 1989. The electricity is shut off again, not because we forgot to pay the bill, but because we pay too regularly. The utility man knows the household that pays the bills can pay the bribes. 
The sun comes and we take dirty clothes outside, except for underwear and cloth pads. My mother stands under the coconut tree with a tub full of water, scrubbing our school uniforms with a carbolic soap. The soap turns the water gray. The soap turns the collars white. The soap eats her fingers red. From the wooden stool, my father reads the Newsweek magazine that the diplomats have left. Someone got killed when he tried to cross the Berlin Wall. Princess Diana wore a satin gown and took New York City by storm. She held babies with AIDS, which was the thing that's supposed to kill by touch. A storm gathers in the sky. And my mother runs to the clothesline. She fans her face with the state-run newspaper. Crush all enemies within. Her body, a warm cattle, thickened by Burmese sun. My father says he can eat rice with nothing but salt, because the war has taught him how to make a meal out of anything. What war? My brother wants to know. Are we at war now? My little sister wants to know. Don't wars have two sides that carry guns? My grandma wants to know. My mother pounds chili and garlic with a stone pestle. My father says he can make a feast with a bowl of rice and a ripe banana. He says even chalk would taste good if you have a little salt. My next poem is about、um, looking back at my memories as children、uh, growing up in Burma. Even though the country had a very repressive regime, I wasn't aware of the happenings, the the terrible things that were happening around. Because、um, as a child, I was raised by a very loving family and extended family, so we were surrounded by love. But you know, even though I may not know all the things that are happening and how people. Live in、uh, terrible conditions.、Um, that I did have a sense of something not quite right out of place there. So this was me looking back at this memory、um, and writing a poem about it. It's called "Count to Ten and Open Your Eyes." The cousins were hiding behind jasmine bushes, mango trees, bamboo grove, yellow Volkswagen, green hedges. Between yards, which scene is unseen? The smallest girl ran after the older girl's tiny legs, round belly, high-pitched squeals. There she fell before she could complete the circle. No, she was found safe, asleep behind the sedge. She curled into a hedgehog, drifted before dusk. You carry the ring, my cousin said, because he only chose me because my sister had mumps. Her cheeks were inflamed, engorged, monsoon furious. Hence my white dress with lace trimming. Hence I walk down the street carrying this plastic ring. Once upon a time is such a cliche. Rangoon's son was relentless, which is another cliche. A dog snuck behind my legs and took a nip at my calf. What wedding contained a feral dog? The house had a red tile roof and metal bars on doors. Snakes crept in when we weren't looking. Formed ropes from behind the toilet. This was where I learned to check behind each door, chair, commode, bed. Tree, shrub, mailbox, neighbors, walls, telephones, eyes, the dog's food bowl, the house geckos squeezed translucent eggs out of their glass bellies, and left them between the screen door as their condolences. This is your birthstone," said the ball, rosy-cheeked astrologer. Or was he a numerologist?
a palm reader or a psychic? I couldn't keep track. The human gods we worshipped file in one after another. Dingy, dusty, draggled, dismal, doomed, conditioned. His yellow cotton candy teeth. No one went out after 6 p.m. The national convention must succeed. Let's defend for posterity of our nation's sovereignty. Gossip becomes gospel with enough repetition. So my reflection in the mirror, I was six. The ring slipped off in spite of my mother whining tiny threads around it. You'll grow into it, be patient. Clouds are cliche too, say the paper with sky, water, square, salamander is air then maybe you could get away with so many things. For weddings, my mother wore purple orchids in her hair. Nothing for funerals. She hated hibiscus. Bold, shameless, showy floral sluts. In the purse, she found two white pills and swallowed without water. Hide the skin. Do not wear it openly in the next life. Skin like garnet, resinous, semi-precious. Decades after World War II ended, my mother eats rice with her fingers when there is no guest in the house. Some things begin out of necessity. Some things continue out of identity. In 1991, I stepped out of the Chicago O'Hare Airport saw heaps of snow for the first time. There are worlds made of ice. Now I am in one. If you stare into the depth of the garnet stone long enough, you could see a universe forming or dissolving. See how this ring fits my finger now. Promising, hopeful, formed, circular, vitreous, metamorphic. My last poem, I want to dedicate to all the 800, over 800 lives lost since February 1st because of the military coup. And I'm especially dedicating to three Burmese poets who were brutally killed just by writing what they feel, which is they wanted freedom and to be treated with human dignity. It's called The Fatality List. April 2021, the boys in Yango, the girls in Mandalay, mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers, children hiding in towns and villages, say the word spring revolution, followed by the fatality list. I pour over their names the way my mother pours water over her jasmines, drooping under Yango heat with great trepidation and ripened tenderness. The six-year-old, stopped by a bullet, had wanted to know the ending of the story her father had been telling. The 10-year-old at the edge of her garden was tasting a slice of coconut carved out of the shell at the moment she fell. The boy who whispered, I can't hold on any longer the teenager in a black t-shirt leaning forward to no future. The poet handing out these words. They shoot in the head. They don't know the revolution is in the heart. And just this morning, a boy returning home became as cold as a stone. Every day, every day, this list grows heavy with the burden of carrying these names. The absence of conscience is equal to the presence of bodies broken on the streets. Their unmade bones, disassembled muscles, blown bits of dreams hollowed out by ruptured cells. The shouts of Doye, our cause, our freedom, flood into the tyrant's ears unstoppable 
like the force of Cyclone Nargis. The absence of his conscience is a cup filled with a child's spilled blood. Thank you so much for listening. Um, if you need to reach out to me and read more of my work, I believe um, Kenneth and Aaron had put out in the comments and also in my bio. So please feel free to read my work and also um, look at the um, humanitarian effort that I am uh, doing, fundraising. And there is a website that um, I believe uh, linked in the comments also. So if you could check it out, I appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks very much. A, I really appreciate just the um, just a reminder of how much power there can be in the truth um, and how threatening um, good and truth telling art can be to those in power. So I really, really appreciate that reminder. Definitely want to return to that uh, in our conversation at the end. So thanks very much for your poems. Thank you. All right, so stick around. Next poet is Kenny Fresh, a Hawaii native, literary enthusiast, published author, entomology fan, fun-loving father and husband. As an Indiana University graduate with a Bachelor of Science in Biology and an associate degree in Chemistry, his love for science and poetry actualized, provides a distinctive performance art experience. Uh, Refresher Point LLC, his company is a spoken word brand that reaches beyond cultural and societal barriers to simply provide another fresh lens to see the world and ourselves. So, Kenny Fresh, welcome to the stage, and I will give you the mic. Kenny, as an FYI, you probably need to unmute yourself and then I think you'll be good to go. Sorry about that. My, my mouse was acting funny. There you are. All good. <laughs> it's all you. Welcome to 2021. Right, 2020, right. 2020, the sequel. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. All right. All you. Thank you. <clears throat> hey, how y'all doing? My name is uh, Kenny Fresh, and I'm excited coming at you uh, representing Louisville, Kentucky slash Southern Indiana. Uh, got a few poems for y'all, and I'll be out your way. Um, yeah, this first one is just a question. How are you? <clears throat> how are you? No. How are you really? Most of the time we respond with fine, but that's because we understand that those asking the question really don't care and definitely don't have the time. This fast paced society doesn't give us time to truly speak. So we check in with loved ones that we hardly ever speak social media. Got us checking into concerts and restaurants, but hardly ever clinics and counselors offices. The internet has made the world so much smaller, but we still haven't grown closer. We've just mastered the art of keeping it together and we dare not lose composure. But what happens when pretense fails, depression hits and your wrists look like do not open before Christmas and it's minutes till midnight on December 25th or you looking at pills and liquor hoping they can bring the healing quicker. We worried about the pollution of the sea, but what about the polluted bloodstreams of loved ones we see hurting anonymously? I see you, the pain in your eyes, the quick hesitations of weighing the options in your mind, your brain's abacus, calculating if those inquiring on your trust are truly worthy of your trust because you're scared that if they find out how broken you are, they may need the therapy you refuse to take. It's time out for cookie cutter answers and generic solutions. Don't you dare say, I'm fine. Things will get better with time. And don't you dare hide your stress when I'm blessed. Nah, you was blessed before I ever asked you the question. So again, I ask, how are you, really? But before that question can be posed, be prepared if the person on the receiving end of it takes you to task, letting you know about all the abuse they've had or thoughts of ending it all because there's no hope left. Be prepared to offer them real suggestions. If you don't know how to help them, there's no harm in guessing or getting a second opinion. Help them find what heals them. 
Let them know there's power in prayer and therapy. The two are not mutually exclusive. You see, Jesus had a doctor, technically a physician, and his crew. So I'm guessing that God and science are cool. Let them know there's power in exercise, meditation, even coloring books. This is a crazy world we've inherited where living real life looks ugly. But that's because it's all in one take. There's no time for filters, crop outs, or edits. These are dark days, and we are praying that we can find the exit. This is for those at the end of their rope who have had thoughts about being at the end of one, I believe. That every breath we continue to take is a blessing. In a world that brags on grinding 24-7, there is no harm in resting. No harm in being more concerned with the inner sanctum of your temple rather than the outward exterior of the building. I understand that this life offers more questions than answers like why was your innocence stolen and why did your family feel cursed by cancer? I have no prophetic answers. What I do have is a listening ear, an empathetic heart. I can pray for you to the Lord in Jesus' name if you enter that sort of thing, but I have no spiritual salve, no mental medication. I will probably fail all of your expectations. I just want you to know that I care and I want you to answer me truthfully whenever I ask, how are you? Really? So that is the first poem. It is from my debut collection of uh, chapbook poetry called Equilibrium. And funny story, I was actually supposed to come to the St. Louis Poetry Center in person uh, in June of last year to kind of read with some other poets and really promote the book. And then COVID happened. So I'm, I'm so happy to finally be here, even if it's virtually, to share some poetry with you all. My next poem, uh, I believe in rewarding the listeners. So I've got, uh, I've got a poem that I've never read to any audience before, and it's called, I Need to Call My Dad More Often. And it's exactly what it sounds like. I love my father. He is in his mid fifties, bred of Texas stock. He was braised by his son and refrigerated in his winters. Lessons cooked into his skin I have yet to learn. He is Texan to the bone, but I thank God I have never seen him in cowboy boots or hats filled with at least 10 gallons of Southern pride. Growing up, he told me, you were good little bohog. I like the way you strut. I have no idea what that means. Still don't. It must be a Texas thing. My dad was around always until he wasn't. Until Uncle Sam's siren song sent him out to sea. Like an eviction notice from a landlord, it was something he could ill afford to ignore. It's strange how the military compensates one for staying away from family for months on end. Perhaps this is the calling the deadbeat dads missed, but not my father. Whether three or six months, he always returned. And I relinquished my role as man of the house and stepped back into the role as a part of understudy. My dad loved me too much to let my potential go untouched like a toddler's vegetables. Love is sacrifice and pops gave 50% of himself so that I could live. The sweat from his brow fell so I could sprout. I am a you wood arrow in the hands of one who wants to shoot me farther than he's ever traveled. He's aimed me away from laziness, poverty, and statistics. His lessons are unending. He instructs me in the logistics of avoiding police officers' ballistics. A black father's job is never done. He seeks his seeds scatter out into the cruel world he tried to shield them from. I wonder if my father prays that my siblings and I will lay him to rest before he has to bury us. Now I'm a dad, and I'm wondering how my pops did it. The ins and outs to black fatherhood and what he would do different. I call him old man now. He has many more years behind than he does in front. While he still draws breath, I must mine lessons from the caverns of his cranium. He's my dad, the onlyest one I've ever had. I should call him more. I think he'll like that. That's that piece. Um, got two more for you. This next one is another, um, yeah, just call your people. I think 2020, the, the pandemic showed anything. People lost um, loved ones, had to say goodbye via Skype. Um, just call your people, check on them. Cause you never know when the last day is the last day. Um, this next one, <laughs> it's interesting. I heard a lot of people complain that 2020 was the worst year of their life um, and that wearing a mask was hard. 
and they called the depression and being black in America, I felt a way about that. <laughs> so this next one is called Karen's complaints. Both uh, words are started with the letter K, Karen's and complaints. Uh, when I see a white person complain about the pandemic, that the year of 2020 was the hardest of their lives, I simply search the room for another black person and smirk. My fellow Americans, this may surprise you, but a worldwide pandemic is the least of my people's concerns. You'll see masks and arrows in a store and cry oppression. The right to live and breathe unrestricted for you ain't optional, but for me to make it through America unscathed is impossible. Because racism and white supremacy remind me of a childhood movie. Everything the light touches is its animal kingdom. Who would have thought the jungle could be gentrified? The coronavirus casts a cloud over Pride Rock. A virus doesn't discriminate between the haves and have nots. It might be the only thing that truly doesn't see color. Some folks complaining, asking why life is so hard. I say welcome to the elephant's graveyard. Welcome to the remains of forgotten history. Here lies the truth that didn't quite make it into the books. We are so quick to praise the valor of the victor, but never heed the voice of the victim. It must sound like whining in the ears of an older sibling with their younger counterpart and a headlock yelling, why are you resisting? Tell me again how it feels to be escorted out of stores, failing to wear masks and social distance. We ask you, Karen, why are you resisting? You think you know how it feels, but you don't know the half. We've been held down for centuries. Y'all claiming a year. That ain't even good math. Our history in this country and America in a pandemic, there's no comparison. We've been treated as disease ridden before the Rona started hitting. As if this black was plagued that spreads like the bubonic. Some act like handshakes were a death sentence. I can see them wriggling in their skin. Because our hands touch during the exchange of money. This one act turns to delicate surgery. This one act turns to delicate surgery. The worst version of operation because here lies the dilemma. How to accept that green cash and coins without touching the black and brown hands underneath. Instead, the money is placed on the counter and slid like a batter careening into home plate. We completed the transaction without touching so the umpire can declare it safe. Folks been afraid to touch us unless it was to cuff us. Some never wanted us to breathe the same air back when my people had to avert their eyes to avoid the white gaze. Explain the difference between sanitizing and ethnic cleansing. Because both seek to eradicate those considered stains on humanity's hands. Black folks been practicing social distancing for so long, we should be partners in a private forum alongside the indigenous and other minorities. Just because we're on the margins doesn't mean we aren't part of the story. What's an executive order to stay in the house when folks were praying that men in masks weren't gonna burn it down? Reduce the place of safety to memories and matchsticks. Some ain't covering their faces now, but had no problems with hoods back in the day. It's so hard to take some of y'all seriously. When the privilege equate oppression to inconvenience is only there, if only, there was a group of people who felt what you felt, told where to go and what to do. One whose rights were stripped from them, like the flesh under the heavy hand of a whip, whose businesses said that only certain people were welcome. Denied the basics of life under the right to refuse service. Some of y'all want to be black so bad. Now here's your chance. There's no vaccination for ignorance. No two-step dosage to wipe out systemic racism. We hear what it's like. We really do. Funny how you want us to be all ears when it's happening to you. You had only one sample and it feels so real. As a black person in this country, I can only try not to smile when I ask, how does it feel? That is that piece, Karen's complaints. Uh, <laughs> uh, if you like what you hear, um, my, uh, you know, the www.refresherpoint.com is the website and, um, I did just put out a spoken word EP on Bandcamp. I'll, I'll drop that in the comments um, as well. And this last one, I want to end on a positive note. <clears throat> it's called Just Imagine. I was part of an art show last week, and it was called Just Imagine. So imagine what life would be like, what our relationship with the environment would be like if we didn't have scarcity that was caused by white oppression or white supremacy. So mm. here we go. <clears throat> 
Just imagine not having to wage war on poverty because we paid our workers properly. A living wage with more life in our days. A world where blacks didn't have to beg for scraps. Position below a table we were never invited to. Praying for food to fall from plates not designed for us to eat from. No more mouths open wide begging for opportunities to be placed inside, but instead force fed. Empty promises to fill up on not nows and just waits. It would be normal not to see white bread as the optimal with the crust cut off. So as to save that bleached flour from contact with anything the shade of brown, imagine a world with wheat, pumpernickel, and rye. And America with no choice but to swallow this dark bread with grains as coarse as the natural hair many ask to touch. An example of how nature's best isn't white bread. No longer will we have to wonder how much of ourselves could we be to leave our white voice dead in the streets. The freedom to use words like ain't, finna, and lit during meetings, stringing together only words and phrases we know. Chad would ask where the money reside and we would say nothing or hint with coy replies. The Urban Dictionary may become required reading. Imagine the arrogance to look our counterparts in the eye and say, we ain't come here but we sure ain't leaving. No more insults like Uncle Tom or Coon because there's nobody to sell out to. As we wipe away the blemishes of supremacy, how would it feel to be finally free? The long-awaited fulfillment to an ancient prophecy. No longer in hell, we can breathe out now. Don't mind me, I'm just dreaming out loud. Thank you, I'm Kenny Fresh, that's my time. Appreciate y'all. Goodness gracious. I just, I cannot thank you enough for being exactly who you are. Um, I also have to say, as somebody who does diversity, equity, and inclusion work for a living, I feel a billion different ways about your honesty. So I just really appreciate it. So um, yeah, thanks for being here tonight. So stick around for the end. Thank you. Final reader of the evening is Stephen D. Schroeder. His second book, The Royal Nunsuch from Sparkwheel Press, won the Devil's Kitchen Reading Award from Southern Illinois University. He edits the online poetry journal, which is just a dollar sign. I'm going to leave it to him to tell me what to call it. Poetry is currency. Uh, his poetry is available from New England Review, Crazy Horse, Michigan Quarterly Review, The Cincinnati Review, Copper Nickel, and diagram. He works as a creative content manager for a financial marketing agency in St. Louis, Missouri. Without further ado, Steve Schroeder. Hey. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. This is actually the first uh, Zoom or uh, online reading I've done uh, since the pandemic started. So uh, hopefully uh, I will uh, live up to uh, reading last. Thank you so much to uh, Kenneth and Aaron and everybody at the St. Louis Poetry Center. You all have always been great to me. Uh, thank you also to A and Kenny Fresh for reading. That was a great job for both of you. Um, and so I'll just uh, run through a few poems here and uh, and that'll be that. Uh, I'm gonna start with uh, a poem that was uh, inspired by uh, obsessively reading the uh, news feed at CNN uh, during the worst of the pandemic last year. Uh, it's called Live Updates. Live Updates, 48 posts in the past 24 hours, sorted old to new. Rumors could spread by breath or touch screen. Virus might transmit through fecal matter. Inspection of city sewage predicts infection spikes. Disease causes massive gastrointestinal distress. Government's emergency toilet paper reserve disappears. President declares war against contagiousness. Study finds crowds are fine except for people. Nations shut-ins should feel fucking lucky, some say. You don't get it unless you get it, epidemic skeptic says. Would many, many cases at once reset the meter? Infection curve becomes a thrilling theme park roller coaster. Economy won't fall if we don't look down. Foreign virus production brought back on shore. States unsure whether to reopen businesses by force. Students return to learning 33% virtual, 33% in person, 33% in purgatory. Experts recommend not coughing into 50 uncovered mouths a minute. Officials debate suggesting protective shrugs. Is an ounce of prevention worse than death? Too inconvenient to even ask about, prevention survey says. 
tests show 50% or less may or may not have or have had infection. Poll shows 50% wouldn't know this symptom if it bit them. Virus could turn random internal organs into goo or maybe glue. Molten gold is a miracle cure, according to commercials. Disease targets losers, according to anonymous sources. Ignore the bodies, according to executive order. To double the number of beds available, hospitals cut and stack. Disturbing minority healthcare disparities update number 834. Potential defects investigated in protective shrugs. Study of molten gold injections hints at harmful side effects. Eccentric pharmaceutical firm starts vaccine scavenger hunt. Virus power rankings versus cancer. Car wrecks. Context. Expertise distrusted, experts claim, but should you trust them? Study determines unconfirmed reports survive in air for hours. Disease caused by lies, president alleges without evidence. Opinions differ on drinking molten gold for health. Wealthy megadonors to wallow in vaccine dose pool. Tracking shows cases coming closer and closer. Tracking shows cases coming from inside the house. Virus might be hiding behind you as you read this. How long before your clenched chest is more than worry? Study discovers your space compresses a little each night. Why the recurring dream where you can only mime goodbye? This distant has a different definition now. Is what is, what will be, or what was, be again? Virus might transmit if you think about it. Virus variant might transmit if you don't think about it. Everything you thought you knew has changed. Too normal could be the newest warning sign. And I'm going to read uh, one poem from each of my uh, first two books and then a couple other new ones. And uh, that will be that. Uh, so the first one from one of my books is from the first book, which is Torch Verse Ends. And uh, this is, uh, imagine this as sort of a, a pamphlet or brochure uh, called, So You Want a Worker. You may only hire a worker if you promise to feed it and clean its messes. Please allow two to four weeks for delivery of your worker. Please allow your worker out of its metal crate twice a day for exercise. If you turn the heat up slowly, your worker will not attempt escape. You may only redeem your worker for store credit with a receipt. Your worker must be this tall to board the corporate jet. You may not carry your worker in your briefcase. Your worker will not attack itself in the mirror if you're watching. Do not bite your worker back. Wagers on your worker fighting are legal in international waters. Your worker is licensed for Florida and Indiana only. In India, your worker is a delicacy or sacred, maybe both. Your worker does not contain tasty candy bars for vending. The tenth time you use your worker, you earn a free drink. No, you may not buy another worker. You don't pay the one you have. Your worker will stare up at dropping stocks until it drowns. When your worker dies, bury it after you leave it in the freezer at least a year. Do not flush your worker. All right, and then um, this poem from my second book. Uh, the second book is The Royal Nunsuch. And uh, this uh, poem comes from, I think, originally just the fact that uh, when I was growing up, I loved very warlike toys, you know, playing guns, G.I. Joes, that sort of thing. And it's very much um, certainly was then and still, I think, to a large extent, something very indoctrinated in our culture growing up. Uh, this is called No Hope Except in Arms. This knife sells itself. This assault rifle will change your life. This rocket launcher is a limited time offer. This hand grenade can shred a head of lettuce in under seven seconds guaranteed or will refund your money. This armor piercing bullet kills 99% of household fungi, molds, and mildews. This auto cannon disinfects the world's surface for our descendants. This fighter jet is part of a complete breakfast. This aircraft carrier cares. This main battle tank thanks the good Lord and its mama. This cruise missile redefines its mission so it never misses school plays. This bunker buster bomb is user-friendly, idiot-proof, and child-safe for the entire family to enjoy, 8 to 88. This gun wants to tuck your kids into bed. 
This one would fuck anybody. All right, and then just a, a couple more new ones here. Um, this one, uh, I think, to put it quickly, is uh, sort of uh, based on the idea of uh, the the phrase uh, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. It's called the real problem. Our solution had class. Our solution had so much class, its jumbotron said classy in neon green, 25 feet high. Our solution had a quesadilla press. Our solution had a V8 Hemi. Because our solution had a hammer, everything looked like the problem. People blindfolded and spun dizzy by our solution pinned the problem on our predecessors. We regretted to inform people our solution came back more addictive and contagious and toxic than the problem, so we didn't. Instead, we said, there's a problem so long and loud that people saw that we thought they didn't know the problem from a hole in the ground. We threw plastic bags and pesticides and denials in the hole until it became a real problem. Our solution threw money around, other people's money, of course. We said they don't work of other people's solutions after we cracked their kneecaps in freak pickaxe accidents. The holes, ammonia, and sulfur smell came from untapped gas reserves or hell. When people fell in with a helpful shove, we shoveled our solution over them and said, this is the hill you picked to die on, until they couldn't tell what direction was up and up. Our simple solution, gut solution, straight shooting solution, populist outsider solution, our solution that contained a hole within an even deeper hole. All right. In this one, uh, picture a local news broadcast, and it's called The News. 50% of our marriages ended in stalemate, the rest in restaurants. We all tested above average as drivers, a phenomenon known online for its leap the median meme. A pie chart infographic showcased pie shortfalls with an empty piece bigger than six o'clock. On what remained of Main Street, the most popular building styles were brutal and Beirut. Behind our poor investments hid the Swiss, according to reports that slurred precision into a slur. More employers hired mountain men and women than financiers and lawyers whose numbers we had financed longer than the law allowed. The trend where workers threw themselves in front of a bullet train shocked the stock market. In a survey, area hospitals estimated railroad-related fatalities at 100 possibilities from none to untracked. The top tactic to cope with sorrow started with cans of chocolate frosting. Nine out of 10 dentists were identified by dental records. The 10th dentist was identified by investigators as a person of interest and an alleged pediatric practitioner. If we took the black medicine, nothing bad would happen. If we flipped the black switch to obey, something bad would happen to a stranger in a soundproof room. In mirrors, ambulance became danger. One cure for our hunger required a runaway dump truck. After the break, the Indians won and thunderstorms were coming. All right, and I think I will just do uh, one more. And this uh, is, at the moment, the uh, actual endnotes of uh, what I hope will soon be my third book. Um, and in addition to being the endnotes, it's a poem called Endnotes. This book needs no introduction. Don't you know who this book is? This book was decided by a single vote. This book is everybody's favorite. Children and adults alike will love this book. Love this book or leave it. This book must be seen to be believed. This book has seen on TV. This book is better than the movie. This book has a great idea for a book. This book is too good to be true. This book is proudly made in America. American history is made up of this book. This book is made up. This book is a trade secret. This book slathers. This book upsizes and upsells. Buying this book earns triple reward points. This book has an optional vacuum attachment. This book collects military hardware. There's no I in this book. This book gives 110% effort. This book trusts its gut above statistics. This book played offensive line in high school. 
This book rubs dirt on its injuries. This book sweats the weakness out. A glacier is on this book's bucket list. This book eats what it kills. This book won't shit where it eats. This book wants a steak well done or bloody. This book wants to speak to the manager. Talking money in this book is taboo. This book aspires to be a billionaire. Millennials are killing this book. Why bring politics into this book? This book doesn't perceive color. This book has black friends. With all due respect, this book, well, actually this book, this book is what she said. This book buries its heartache far inside. This book cures your disrespect behind its back. This book is always on. This book isn't over when it's over. Please obey this book's instructions. Avoid sudden loud noises near this book. Maintain a straight sight line to this book. Do not put this book in your eyes. Do not overfeed this book. Do not operate this book while intoxicated. This book is a choking hazard. This book is a leading cause of accidental pregnancy. Symptoms of this book include nausea and anxiety. There's no known cure for this book. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Steve. I really appreciate that. And we got uh, Kenny Fresh snapping it up. And A is, our, um, A is back with us too. So um, first of all, just uh, thank you for the honor of being with y'all. It's really, really a pleasure to hear you all read your work. We do have uh, a little bit of time to have a bit of a conversation before we close up our evening. So um, I'm going to start just by getting right into it. All of you um, really give a damn about the world <laughs> in your own way. Um, when we were uh, backstage before our reading began this evening, we were in conversation with A and um, her connection with Myanmar. I just happened to take a few minute break from work today and open up my New York Times app and happened upon an article that actually posted in the comments for the Facebook video about how um, 30 uh, or probably more 30 uh, that we are aware of uh, poets in Myanmar are being imprisoned and killed for their poetry. So um, I guess I just want to open up the question and uh, A, I'm obviously going to ask you to start. Um, talk to me about your view these days, the social responsibility of a poet. Last month, our readers or yeah, our, our readers um, disagreed. So I hope we will disagree this evening as well, but I just want to hear your thoughts on what does it mean to be a poet in 2021 in these times? Well, I think that's a great question. I think, you know, as poets, um, not that we have more empathy than others, but we tend to be more expressive. Um, at least we share what we feel with others uh, publicly. And so to me, um, and just based on my observation and what I feel and, you know, we use writing as a sort of not just for connection, but expressing and sometimes it's a sort of therapy also if you are feeling deeply about something. And if you're in a situation with a social like, for example, like Myanmar, where extreme conditions, you see it, you observe it, not just to you directly, but to others. So as a I feel like it is not just taking on as a social responsibility, mm -hmm. but um, as a way to sharing what you feel and somebody else is saying, hey, that's exactly what I feel and just mm -hmm. didn't have the words to express or didn't have the courage to express. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people might be writing a journal, but don't want to share it. So by doing that, it become um, the connection between everything it become a force. And that is, you know, I believe it's a reason that simple words like, you know, the, the the line that I quoted in my poem, which was literally written by one of the dead poets um, in Burma is what he said was, they shoot in the head, they don't know the revolution is in the heart. Simple mm -hmm. words, but people identify so much. And that is the reason that he was killed, that he was not afraid to say, um, the words that everybody is feeling, but maybe no, don't have the mean to express it. So for me as a poet, um, it's not so much as a responsibility, but I will encourage people to um, be a force in that, that just because you are not just like purposely, it's, you know, it's not the, 
you have to do it. But by doing so, you 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 are um, bringing on people that might have been in the shadow and don't mm-hmm. have the need to cope with certain things, you know, mm-hmm. certain things. Um, just like when Kenny is saying stuff, you know, I'm nodding along, you know, not, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think, you know, there's a lot of people listening and saying nodding along that he's saying stuff that I know that I feel, but maybe I don't have the words for it. So since mm-hmm. it's, you know, as a poet, that's very important. I mean, I'm hearing you try, try to make a connection between the words and just a shared human experience, right? Um, mm-hmm. and kind of drawing that out of people. Um, Steve, Kenny, any thoughts on that? What does it mean to be a poet? You know, I keep thinking about these days, Audrey and Rich's poem about what kind of times are these, right? And this this balance between, um, you know, speaking to us, to a, um, we're living in this just kind of turmoil, social conflict all over the world versus writing poems about trees, right? Uh, not as if that's binary, but certainly we have to kind of strike that balance. Right. Um. I'd like to say, I think being a poet, you know, I think Nina Simone said it best that, you know, an artist's job is to, you know, report the times. And so um, for me, it's uh, it's really just about speaking what you see. And um, I feel challenged to try to bring hope at some parts. Uh, you know, that's why I kind of ended my set with the Just Imagine, because it's super easy to write about the bad stuff. There's so much bad stuff going on. Uh, yeah. I, like there's been times where I, when outside was outside, like the open mics would leave you depressed. I'm like, man, it don't seem like nobody has any hope. So I, I challenge myself. One of my my personal challenges to myself as a poet is to one, speak to people's pain, but then two, offer some semblance of, of hope. And so with the Karen's complaint, I just really that was like a mirror. Um, I, and for me, what does it mean to be a poet is it's like I'd rather write a poem and share it than be really pissed off and like go online and post something that like, ah, no, I just, I'd rather write a lot of times, like kind of like A said, my poetry is my therapy. Like I see stuff, I'm like, ah, instead of reacting to it, instead of going off, I'm like, you know, let me just sit down and write with this or sit down and see if this is even something that's worth writing about. And uh, that's just kind of what what I do for myself. Steve, what are your thoughts on this? Well, um, sort of to your point, um, I think, I, I I don't think that being a poet now, despite the tumultuous times, means there's some sort of moral imperative to be socially or politically engaged with your poetry. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you 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 said your poems about trees, which obviously is an exaggeration. But um, when people choose not to be socially or politically engaged in their poetry, I think they should be aware that that's also a political and social choice they're yes. making. It's just in a different way. Um, and the other, the other, the other sort of thing I would mention is um, the, the the flip side of that coin, especially for uh, someone like me, is that um, when you try to write about sort of the injustices in the world, um, I come from a very privileged place, obviously, and so I have to be careful. Um, I think a lot of poets do if they get involved in writing about that sort of thing to do it from a, a place of empathy and a place that they're actually really able to speak to rather than sort of being a uh, tourist yeah. in, in that subject. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's a tricky balance to strike. I get that. I think, um, you know, last month, um, Bob Lovis sort of said, you know, I cannot imagine a, a poet in 2021 not speaking to the politics of the time and sort of Ben Gaz's challenge to him was, yes. And also, I feel like my job is to again, I'm obviously like a paraphrase, is to write about trees, is to describe the the what if, you know, the kind of possible beauty of the future, kind of to your point, Kenny, about describing yeah. hope. So yeah, it's certainly a balance to strike. I'm, I'm curious too, you know, you all um, have mentioned poetry for you as being something that is um, therapeutic, where you, um, you know, are working through a thought, working through an emotion to get to a place where you can um, put it out into the world for others to engage with. Um, I'm really um, kind of thrilled by the fact that this evening we we have poets, n- none of whom are 
directly and consistently employed by and engaging with um, academic, you're not making money as an academic poet, <laughs> which is kind of how poetry, at least for me, when I was, you know, going through uh, um, undergrad and thinking about going into an MFA, that was really the way that poetry was kind of defined for me. So um, I don't want to pretend that the, there's any sort of like magic to the creative process that we can kind of like unveil for everybody. But I'm curious to, as to how you, um, as a working human being in the United States these days, carve out time for poetry. What does your process look like? Does it look like sort of slotting in 10 minutes here and there, kind of like I do, and then kind of harvesting the the random um, fruits that come out at the un other end of that. How do you, um, I'm just very curious on a practical level, how kind of poetry fits into your day to day. And I'm gonna randomly pick on Steve to start again. Right. Um, well, I don't think I have a very consistent process. Uh, so it's gonna be a fairly short answer, but um, <laughs> I try to, I, I, I try to kind of write in my head fairly often, even when other things are going on. And, mm. and fortunately for the moment, my memory is good enough that I can pretty well keep that <laughs> stuff in mind. Um, the other thing that I think uh, is important for me is having a bedside notebook because one time mm. when I actually really think well is when I'm going to sleep or when I wake yeah. up. Um, and so if I if I think of something then I do have to write it down or I will forget it. Um, and then the, the the bad part of it is I do have insomnia issues and sometimes that's connected to writing. Like I can write during mm. those or sometimes I'm thinking too much about the poetry and that's what causes it. And so that's, there's a whole sort of thing. But, but that's not really process, that's just a problem. Yeah, <laughs> that's very meta. <laughs> a or Kenny, how do you squeeze poetry in? I don't have a regular practice. Um, uh, you know, I try to make time. I would say I'll write it in the morning. It, it, I don't have a set routine. Usually, I just it just requires me sitting down. Um, sometimes, you know, you might be I might be walking and an idea or inspiration might struck, and I'll come back and write something. Mm -hmm. uh, so it just uh, it's just more of an ad hoc approach. Uh, so whatever comes to me, I'll write it down, or I'll revisit something that I've written and then maybe work on it more. Um, that's you know that's more required practice, like looking through pieces and uh, try to refine it more later. So for me, it's whatever, whatever, uh, you know, my news come, I'll just uh, write something about it. Yeah. Kenny, what about you? I'm also very, as a, as a, also a dad, um, trying to <laughs> make my way through parenting as a poet. I'm curious about your answer too. Yeah. Um, for me, uh, it was a lot harder. I think before 2020, uh, 2020, it was crazy because actually like uh, I left my job to try to really pursue being a writer and a poet. So I left my job and then the world shut down. So I had nothing but time to write. Um, but um, before, even before then, I would just, whenever I could, like uh, I would write, I worked in a lab. So I have a journal or something in between going to swab samples. I'd write, I'd write on lunch breaks um, mm -hmm. and kind of speak to what everybody else said is, when I get an idea, like I have to write it down because I will forget. And my, when people are, oh, your poetry so great. I'm like, you should have heard the stuff that I didn't write down. <laughs> uh, I, I, have, I have poem ideas scattered all over the place, whether it's the notes app on my phone, in my, my journal, my poetry journal. Um, but now that I'm- gonna get me hives just, just saying that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I have a, a routine in, in the morning. It's, it's uh, pray, read, write. So pray mm -hmm. first. Then I read, uh, I've, got, I've got like several books I'm reading at the same time. And then, uh, then the writing, I typically do my personal writing in my journal. I try to write, because I have a, a personal journal and a poetry journal. And I try to write in either one of those every day. And so a lot of times, the, if the inspiration is dry for the poetry, I'll write what's going on in my day. And then sometimes that will bleed into a poem or conversations with my wife or like, I'm like oh, that's, that'd be a really good, own title or just the foolishness I see on social media. Like when people say they can't write, like there's so much stuff around, especially with uh, the, the pandemic and everything that's going on in the world or, you know, so it, it's inspiration everywhere. I try not to wait for inspiration. I try to write um, and I challenge myself to try to write maybe an hour a day. Um, if And of course, of course it, do, it doesn't happen sometimes. Sometimes I gotta like wait until, kind of like Steve said, I gotta wait until the daughter goes to sleep. My prime time to write is my daughter goes to sleep at like 10, 11. My, my wife goes back to hang out with her for an hour. She's like, I'll come back and 
I'll, you know, we'll watch a show and typically she falls asleep. And so I'm like, okay, I got a good couple of hours before she, first spot she, right then. Yep. before she wants to Netflix and chill. So it's either early in the morning before everybody gets up or at night when everybody's trying to like, people are falling asleep. Yeah. All right. My best stuff comes at two in the morning for me. Wow. wow. Well, thanks for sharing that. I really appreciate that. Y'all have given me some practices to think about. I want to um, note our time and kind of move towards the end. And if I, if I could ask really quickly uh, for each of y'all um, before I close this up to gather some paradise. This is a practice that I've stolen from Al Phil Reese, uh, who does the Poem Talk podcast for the Poetry Foundation. And I would love for each of you to um, give us a shout out of um, a particular creative um, thing uh, that you have discovered, hopefully in the world of poetry or literature, that has really given you life these days that um, the other folks who are watching our reading should know about. So, uh, Kenny, let's start with you and go backwards the way we came. Okay, sure. Um, I am reading this book called He Saw That It Was Good by Sho Baraka, um, and the subtitle is Reimagining Your Creative Life to Repair a Broken World. Uh, Sho mm -hmm. Baraka is my absolute favorite artist. He's a hip hop artist. Um, and he's just really dope. And so I've, I've been a fan of his since 2010. He put out his first book like May, May 18th. So it's been out for a week now. And uh, that's kind of what's been giving me life, just reading his thoughts um, about using creativity to help repair the world. And so that's really been, I've been highlighting all through it and taking notes and just, yeah, I'm excited about that. That's what's giving me life these days. Very cool. Thank you for that. Hey, why don't you go next? Yeah. Um I will have to give a shout out to my favorite podcast, which is Poetry Unbound. I don't know if you guys oh, are yes. familiar with that. It's uh, it's it's a branch of On Being. Um, mm -hmm. So Poetry um, Unbound is uh, hosted by a, an Irish poet named Padraig Otuma, mm -hmm. and he usually pick one poem. Um, I believe it's it's a twice a day, uh, twice a week forecast uh, broadcast uh, podcast. And there's two season in a year, so usually pick one poem and read it the first time, and then analyze it a bit in a very contemplative, uh, thoughtful way. And then he will bring his own experience in it, um, what he draws on. Um, so that about it's about 15 minutes. Uh, so it's a right size for a poem, one poem. And just to go back to your previous um, uh, question of. What inspired you know how do you, what is your writing uh, ritual you know i think it was billy collins that says you know reading poetry makes you want to write poetry so mm. for me it's like being in that poetry space is inspiring so this poetry unbound literally saved me uh, during the pandemic also there's a lot of good poems and a lot of good analysis yeah, yeah I, my too. gosh, that that yeah. podcast is my um, Sunday afternoon meal prep podcast where I always <laughs> like end up chopping carrots in tears. So right. very that's amazing. a good one. Yeah. All right, Steve, what about you? All right. Well, uh, right now I'm reading uh, this anthology. Let's see if I can do this. There it is. American Journal, 50 Poems for Our Time, edited by Tracy K. Smith, which is a very good little anthology. Um, and then I just, uh, I thought the other thing I could do is I'd like to read a poem by someone else. It's very short. Um, and uh, I discovered it uh, probably last year and it just, it really hits me hard. Uh, it's by a poet named Andrea Cohen. It's called The Committee Ways In. Uh, you can find it online in the Three Penny Review. Committee Ways In. I tell my mother I've won the Nobel Prize. Again, she says, which discipline this time? It's a little game we play. I pretend I'm somebody. She pretends she isn't dead. Wow. Man. Wow. I wasn't ready for that. <laughs> Neither was I when I first read it. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. My goodness. Well, really appreciate y'all gathering paradise with me. Thank you for those um, for those plugs that gets us something to check out after we're done. So um we're going to close out by noting that the next reading is on June 22nd. So definitely mark your calendars. Our reader, readers are going to be Stephanie Russell, Raphael Maurice, and Noelia Cerna. So please make sure and keep your eye out for the June Facebook event uh, via the St. Louis Poetry Center's 
page on Facebook. So definitely like us there and share it far and wide. You'll also be able to view tonight's reading um, on Facebook on that page after tonight. So thanks again to all you poets for sharing your work with us. It's been a real, real pleasure. Thanks for Aaron Quick, our Wizard of Oz um, behind the curtain, turning all of Al Gore's internet gears well for us to um, look good and sound good. Thanks to all of you for choosing to show up this evening who are checking out this reading um, or for checking it out down the road after May 25th to read and hear and see some poetry. So have a good evening. Thanks for joining everybody. Thank you.